starting today and for six Sundays, we'll be in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is the, is the sixth book in the Bible. It comes after Joshua. And it gives an account of the people of Israel after the death of Joshua. After taking over from Moses, Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. Joshua played a pivotal role in fulfilling God's purpose to bring his people into the promised land. His name, Joshua, means the Lord saves. Joshua played this critical role in the salvation of God's people, bringing them out of the wilderness and into possessing the land of promise, Canaan. But Joshua died before this process of possessing and occupying the promised land was complete. Complete success for Israel, brought about by the help of God, that would have meant not only possessing the land of promise, but also fully driving out the Canaanites from that land. But that did not happen. And after Joshua's death, the Israelites were led by different judges, hence the, the name of our book, Judges. And this morning we'll be looking at the situation among the people of Israel as described in the first two chapters of the book of Judges. We'll pick it up in verse 27. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan, or Tanakh, or Dor, or Ibliam, or Megiddo, and their surrounding settlements. For the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nahalol, so these Canaanites lived among them. But Zebulun did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Ahlab or Az Akzib or Helba or Afik or Rehob. The Asherites lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath. But the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. And those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. Joshua was dead. He had done his work in leading the Israelites to possess the promised land. And it was up to the next generation to take things forward. But what we read here is quite a discouraging picture because we see that tribe after tribe after tribe amongst the people of Israel did not drive out the Canaanites. They learned to coexist. They lived together. The Canaanites were living among them. Total success for these people, the Israelites, would have been not only do you come into that land, but you also drive out the Canaanites. 
But tribe after tribe after tribe, they are living together. They're putting them to forced labor. They're mixing. They're mingling together. And you say, what is going on? This was not the best that God had for the Israelites. Why didn't the Israelites drive them out? Why didn't they experience this total success of pushing out the inhabitants from from that promised land so they could live there fully? There are a number of reasons, and we won't look at all the reasons today. But the beginning of chapter 2 gives us an important part of the answer. In Judges 2 verses 1 to 3, It says, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. The angel of the Lord reminded the people of Israel what God had done for them. He had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And he had made a covenant with them. The reason the Canaanites were not driven out was the disobedience of the Israelites. God told the Israelites, do not enter into a covenant with these people. But they did. They lived together. God told them, you you shall not worship any other God except for me. Break down their altars. But they didn't. They went and, 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 and began to worship other gods. So out of the disobedience of, of God's people, his covenant people to whom he had given great promises, God, God allows a situation that was not the very best that could have been for the Israelites. Towards the end of Joshua's life, Joshua actually warns the Israelites. He warns them against idolatry. He tells them, Israelites, God will will, will turn away from you if you do not put away these foreign gods. Choose, Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But you need to choose as well. Who are you going to serve? Because if you keep going after these foreign gods, God will turn from you. And and by then the situation was not as bad as it was here. So the problem was already in the camp. And after Joshua's death, the problem becomes even greater, significantly worse than what it was before he died. In order for the Israelites to experience God's promises, they had to obey what God said. Because they did not obey, they did not experience the fullness of God's blessing. Instead, God turns against them. So dear friends, what what does this mean for us today in 2019? Well, firstly, it means that we also are prone to disobey God. That's not big news, is it? It's like, what? Obvious, we know that. We also are prone to disobey God. We are prone to compromise. We are prone to to live with, with things that we are supposed to completely drive out of our lives and say, no. But we, we compromise. We, we coexist. We don't give God absolute, total, complete obedience and devotion. 
We also are prone to idols, to worshiping idols. God says, worship me only, but our hearts are prone to be divided. And I'll speak more about idols later. It means that we are supposed to build on what the previous generation has done. One of the saddest things about this account is how Joshua's generation, they, they built on, on what Moses' generation had done. But this generation that followed, it's like they were stuck. Things were not moving forward. Our generation should be building on the previous generation as far as spiritual things are concerned. Not only material and physical things. So are we committed to seeing the purposes of God in our generation go forward? Are we devoted to say, God, use us that in our generation, we would see God's purposes established more fully, whatever the cost? It means that we miss out on God's blessing because of the choices that we make not to follow him fully. We need to choose to follow God, not, not partially, not out of convenience, not what works for us. We need to follow God 100% and come out of compromise. Let's carry on the story. We're in Judges 2, verses 10 to 17. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hand of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom, were no longer whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Joshua dies, his, his whole generation dies. This was the generation that had followed God out of the wilderness into the promised land. However, the, the generation that comes after, it's, it says they did not know God. It's not that they, they didn't know who God was, but they, they did not acknowledge God in the same way that Joshua's generation did. They, they did not have a, an acknowledgement to say he is God. They did not appreciate their history. That this is the God who, who brought us out of slavery in Egypt. He is the God who sustained us in the wilderness. He is the God who powerfully, miraculously brought us into the promised land. They did not have an appreciation of the heritage that they had with this saving all-powerful God. So when they enter the promised land, what happens? Well, anything kind of goes. They had been flirting with, with these gods, these idols before Joshua died. Now it was full on, let's get it on with them.
because they were not rooted, properly rooted in the knowledge of God, in a proper relationship with Him. They start to worship Baal, this Canaanite God. His name means Lord. And he was the God of of storms and, and war. Ashtoreth, this prominent female Canaanite goddess. Associated with war as well and probably sexuality. So here's Baal. He's connected to to material needs. You know, the rain brings agricultural production and we can sustain ourselves. He's, he's connected to, to power, war. And, and Ashtoreth, the, fem- the, the goddess, also power and sexuality, sensuality. The, these two gods actually uh, address real human needs, if you think about it. We, we, need, we need to eat, we need to provide. Uh, and, and power used in the right way, well, God actually gives power to, to humans for, for good. And sex, well, that's a gift from God for, for marriage. So there's, there's, there's actually nothing wrong with the things that these gods are associated with. It's just that these things need to be brought under the, the authority and the power of the one true God. Not, not the gods of, of Canaan, but, but the God of Israel, the God of the Bible. And what does he say about those things? And the idol worship by Israel makes, it made God angry because God had made a covenant with them. And this covenant had been renewed before before Joshua had died. And they had broken the covenant. God said, "I, I want to be the only God in your lives. And they're like, nah, we've got another plan. God had been faithful and they responded by being unfaithful. So what does God do? He, he turns against them. Those that they were supposed to plunder, plunder them. Those that they were supposed to defeat, defeat them. And God's people are in great distress. They are in huge trouble. But God does not leave them because he's good, because he's gracious, because he's merciful. God raises up judges. And these judges come and they, and they save God's people from their enemies. But even after they are saved, even after God shows that his character is the same as it was to the previous generations, that he is still just and faithful and gracious, even after he shows his power, what do the children of Israel do? They don't listen to the judges. They prostitute themselves to these other gods. They continue to be unfaithful. And this, this pattern, this fascinating pattern continues right through the book of Judges. It's, it's both sad and very encouraging because sad that, wow, God's people really don't get it. They, they, they sin, God gets angry, they cry out to him, he saves them, then they go back and do the same thing. And the pattern goes on again and, get, and again. And you're like, this is so depressing, it's discouraging. But it's also really encouraging and gives hope because God keeps pursuing his people. They mess up, he comes back. They mess up, he comes back. They mess up, he comes back. He's faithful to his promise. Faithful to his people. So what does this mean for me? What does this mean for you, for us? 
Well, firstly, we need to help the next generation to have a genuine faith in God for themselves. It is really sobering to think that the generation that brought the children of Israel into the promised land, it was a great generation. And you may have heard the expression, Joshua generation. This was, yes, they had faults, they had issues, but they were a generation that did great things for God. And it's, it's really sobering that they, they, they did that and the, the generation immediately after is so different. And we cannot take it for granted that, that the generation that is coming after us will have the same faith that we have. Will have the same passion that we have. Will have the same desire for God that we have. We cannot take that for granted. We actually need to be deliberate in helping the next generation catch a vision for God. We need to be deliberate in instructing the next generation on the truth of who God is, of his saving plan, of the fact that this generation that is following us needs God. They cannot do anything of eternal significance without him. There needs to be a deliberate desire and effort on our parts. And yes, God is the one who saves. God is the one who rescues. We, we can't save anyone. But man, we need to say, I want to be used in my generation to reach out to the generation that is to come. When, 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 when we look at the, the, the young generation of today, the youth of today, and, and some of those are my own children and, and your children. When we look at the next generation that's coming, they are facing so many things, so many challenges, so many things that want to live alongside them, so many things that they are supposed to reject and say no to, but are there as a snare and a trap to them. And what are we going to do? Are we going to sit back and say, no, it's okay. God's got it. Yes, God's got it, but God's got it using you and me. And, and when I think of my own generation, because I, I think we also need to put ourselves in, 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 in the middle of this generation that was going round in circles. I think of my own generation. I'm saying, God, in my own generation, what is going on? Where is the love of God in my own generation? Praise God that there is definitely a love of God there. But there is so much that is happening in my generation, our generation, that people are seeking after things that they should not be. They're ensnared by things that should not be ensnaring them. The lives of, of people in Dar es Salaam, people are distracted. People are not pursuing God and we need to get to a place where we say in my generation God use me in my generation God I want to make a difference in my generation I want to be part of the solution to the going round and round to the snares that cannot leave us to the traps that are there that we cannot seem to shake off God I want to be part of the solution use me in whatever way so will we take a stand not only for the generation to come, but also for our own generation as well? What does this mean for us? We are prone to be unfaithful to God. We are prone to worship idols. You see, today we are not worshiping Baal or Ashtoreth. But we might be worshiping some other God worshiping something other than God. When we think of, of idols, we think of 
of statues, images, something like, something like that. That's an idol. And, and that, that could be the case, that we're literally worshiping uh, an image that has been carved and bowing down to that image. But in this room, chances are perhaps that, you know, that's not the case. So you might say, yeah, yeah I, I'm okay. I, I, whew, I got off the hook, man. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have one of those in my house. <laughs> but but here's, here's the thing with idols. In the book of Ezekiel, it says that Man sets up idols in his heart. You, you don't need one of those to be an idol worshiper. All you need is a sinful heart, which is what everyone in this room has. And I'll be the first on that list. What you need, all you need is a sinful heart because idols are set up there. Anything in our hearts that we make more important than God, that's an idol. And maybe it's, maybe it's your job. In your heart, in your mind, that, that actually, the thing that is most important to you is, is your job. Maybe it's our material possessions. We find our true identity and worth in, in the material things that we own. Maybe it's how much money we have. The real God of our lives is the bank balance. Maybe it's sex. We'll, we'll, we'll do anything and everything we can to, to get sex because that's, that's where true pleasure and true satisfaction, true meaning comes from. Maybe it's our parents. It's, it's, we, we just have to please our parents. As long as mom and dad are happy and, and, and they approve of what we do, then, then everything's okay, even if not everything is okay. And we can be grown men and women, but it's, it's all about mom and dad. Maybe it's our traditions. We have a rich heritage in, in our family. We have traditions. We, 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 we do things a certain way. We always have. We'll never change. Why? Well, we've always done that that way. It's our tradition. That's, that's, that's where we will, we will put our stake in the ground, in the stake of tradition. Maybe it's, it's witch doctors. For, for, for African people, it's, it's interesting. We, we wrestle with the modern life and, and, and embracing the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, 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 and what has been passed on by our ancestors, things like witchcraft and witch doctors. And, and, and we can be in, in, in church on a Sunday morning praising the name of Jesus, but, but come tomorrow. The, the thing that is really going to determine how we're going to live through the week is what the witch doctor said yesterday, Saturday. These are idols. If there is anything that competes with God in our hearts, anything that we think will give us more peace, give us more security, give us more significance, give us more pleasure than God, that is an idol. And as we look at the things I've mentioned, you'll realize many of them are actually good things, really good things. The problem with idolatry is when a good thing 
becomes an ultimate thing. When a good thing becomes the most important thing. When a good thing that should be submitted under God is elevated above God. William Alathorne said this, Whatever a man seeks, honors, or exalts more than God, that is the God of idolatry. What are we supposed to do with idols? Smash their altars. Burn their scrolls. Turn away from them. I love, I love at the end of um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul is, uh, the apostle Paul is commending the church in Thessalonica for being such a great church. And one of the things he says, he says, they, they speak about how you guys have, have turned away from idols to serve the true God and to wait for his son, Jesus, to wait for his return. So what do we do with idols? We, we break their altars, we burn their scrolls, but in our hearts, in our minds, we, we turn away from them. But when we turn away, we turn towards God. That's what we do with idols. And it's an ongoing process. It's a daily process because these hearts of ours daily need to be turned towards God. Thirdly, what does this mean for us? Well, God will judge our actions. There are consequences for our actions. We reap what we sow. If we sow in idolatry and disobedience, we will reap out of idolatry and disobedience. God cannot be fooled. He cannot be mocked. We will reap what we sow. But if we, if we sow in the kingdom of God, if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, out of there we will reap. What does this mean for us? God is faithful. Even when we have been unfaithful to God, He remains faithful to us. God will still love us. God will rescue us even when we have been unfaithful. Think for a moment about a situation where you have been unfaithful. Maybe someone knows about it. Maybe nobody knows about it. Maybe you're still carrying shame about that situation. You're still feeling terrible about it. You know what? God is faithful to you. God loves you. There is nothing, nothing that you could ever do that will make God give up on you. He's faithful. We might be covenant breakers. God is a covenant keeper. And God wants you to take that thing, whatever it is, and, and, and submit it to him and say, God, here, help me with this. Help me with this area of unfaithfulness. Help me to, to see it the way you see it. Help me to turn away from it, if that needs to be the case. What does this mean for us? God is gracious. God gives what we do not deserve. We worship other gods, what does God do? He shows grace. We go off on our own way, what does God do? He pursues us. We fall into a ditch, what does God do? He rescues us. He is full of grace. And God has shown his grace, this incredible grace, by giving us his very, very best, his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent to rescue us from the punishment that we deserve for our sins. But instead of punishment, because of Jesus Christ, we receive forgiveness. God is gracious. 
oh, if only we would see the grace of God. If only we would understand how incredibly gracious God is. Jesus Christ embodies that grace. And we've spoken about Joshua. And Joshua and Jesus are actually quite alike. Jesus' name means the same thing as Joshua's name, the Lord saves. And both are saviors in God's plan of, of redemption. Only that Jesus is way better than Joshua. Joshua was pointing ahead to the, the greater Joshua, Jesus Christ. Joshua died and another generation comes that falters and doesn't know God. Jesus died rose from the dead and we've had generation after generation after generation across the whole earth that knows God and follows God. Joshua dies and the next generation is living far from God. Jesus dies, rises from the dead and 2,000 years later there are generations today that love God and are following God and are devoted to God and are saying, God, call me, use me. God, cleanse me, purify me. God, set me on fire, send me into your purposes. The greater Joshua, Jesus. Joshua did not appoint any clear successes to take over from him after he died, which is why God had to himself appoint judges. Jesus, after he died and rose from the dead, he, he appointed his church, you and I, and he said, you go and do the work. You go and do the mission. As far as I have come, to the point where I have completed my work, now you take it forward. Zeal for God fizzles after Joshua. Zeal for God has been increasing across the world after Jesus. Just think of the persecuted church in places like the Middle East and Asia. There is zeal for God on this earth. There is a passion for God on this earth. There is a zeal for God in this room. Joshua defeats Canaanites. Jesus defeated sin and death. Thank God that the generation in this room, the generations in this room are living on this side of the cross. We are on the side of the cross where we have seen the glory and the splendor and the beauty of God's grace in ways that previous generations didn't, in ways that Joshua's generation didn't. And we are now surrounded by a, a great cloud of witnesses that is cheering us on and saying, hey, run for God. Are we going to be part of a generation that has a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ? A generation that is not seeking after idols. A generation that is turning away from idols and pressing forward into the purposes of God. What kind of generation are we going to be? You see, there's always a choice. Joshua 
gave them a choice. He said, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the choice was made. Following God is choice after choice after choice. You see, you may have made a choice five years ago. Perhaps God is calling you to make another choice today. You may have made a choice last year. Perhaps God is calling you to make another choice today. Perhaps you've never made a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. In Jesus Christ, God has given himself fully so that we can give ourselves fully. I'm going to ask Nathaniel and Ima to come and play some instruments as we come to the end now. And I invite us to stand. I would like to pray. And the way I feel the Lord leading us to pray this morning is that we should pray that we would be a generation that is fully devoted to God. A generation that says, God, there's really only one way to live, and that's your way. You know, when we talk of idols, one of the biggest idols that sits on the throne of our hearts is us, ourselves. We want to be in control. We want to be in control of that area of our lives. And, and God says, no, actually, the, the, the only way to really live for me is to, is to totally abandon yourself to me. Everything. Not some areas, but everything. Your marriage. Totally abandoned to me. Your job. Totally abandoned to me. Your career, whatever plans you have, totally devoted to me. Every relationship, every, every dollar, every cent that you have, totally devoted to me. I want it all. I don't want to have to coexist with things that are kind of holding you, snares that compromise. I don't want that. I want you fully. Everything. That's the God that we serve. And that's the choice He's calling us to make today. So what I'd like to do is if you want to live that way, if, if that's you, I'm going to call you now and say, come to the front. I want to pray for you. I want you to express what's in your heart right now by taking a step of faith and coming and standing here in the front so I can pray for you. And I know there's people like that this morning, so please come quickly. Come forward. Thank you. Men. Women. Come forward. Give yourself fully to this one true God. He's not to be messed with. He's not to be played with. He's not to fit in our box, in our world. We are to fit into His. Yes, come forward. There's lots of space at the front here. If you're still thinking, I want to be there, yes, do come. I want to pray for you. Father, you know our hearts. Father, you know we worship idols. You know we set up idols in our hearts, Lord, and we don't give you everything. So, Father, forgive us. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thank you that through Jesus our sins are washed away. Thank you that through Jesus we, we have new life. We're part of your family. 
Father, I thank you for every person who's come forward this morning. I thank you, Lord, for putting courage in them, putting your love in them, putting obedience in them, putting faith in them. And Father, I want to pray that every man and woman here that has come forward would have a fresh sense of destiny, a fresh sense of purpose in what you have called them to be. A child of God, a son and a daughter of the great King. Father, I pray that you would turn them away. You would turn us away from a life of compromise and bring us to a place of complete, of total devotion to you. Lord, those things that are sitting in our midst, those things that we are flirting with, those areas of compromise that we have allowed to latch onto our hearts, we ask today, God, that you would dislodge them, that you would remove them, that you would give us a passion, an undivided seal, a devotion to God that is only for you and no one else. Help us, God, to turn away, to turn away from idols and to you and to wait for the return of our Lord Jesus in fear and trembling and in service to his kingdom. Help us to smash the altars. Help us to burn the scrolls. Help us to put aside every idol that would raise itself up against you. Help us, Lord, to make this a daily thing and every single day thing that our hearts would be seeking only after you. Oh, Father, make us a generation that will make a difference. Make us a generation that will stand for something different. A generation that will see something different. A generation that will influence the city of Paul, the nation of Tanzania, the nations of the world for the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit to give us the boldness, to give us the courage, to give us the strength to live in this wicked and depraved, this crooked generation which we are a part of. That we would be light, that we would be salt, that we would be those that bring the goodness, the truth, the power, the goodness of God, that the kingdom of God will come through us. That we will be the agents of your kingdom. That you have given us the keys to unlock your kingdom. And we will carry those keys with purpose, with destiny, with conviction, with love and humility. And with the authority that you have given to us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have work for us to do. May we do it well for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.